Okay, so uh, today we have the pleasure of Clifford Johnson giving us a talk about non-perturbative studies in JT gravity and supergravity. And so um, please take it away. Well, hi everyone. Um, and uh, sorry, I can't be there in person. It's a standard remark, but an important one to make because it's true. And um, I hope nevertheless that we can have a good discussion. So. I uh, also, I think we uh, agreed that I would stay around after the talk um, for a little bit of uh, extra time and we can have a discussion uh, and pursue various questions that I hope occur to you as, as I go along. But if a burning question uh, springs to mind, don't be shy, dive in, because uh, it might be that I said things. It's likely it's because I said something unclearly or uh, insufficiently, um, uh, uh, you know, I assumed uh, knowledge that uh, wasn't present, or um, uh, it, it, uh, it might help divert us to a more, a more interesting discussion than I had intended to, pretend, to, to present. Either way, jump in. Um, but uh, um, we'll have a longer discussion uh, uh, in, the, in the last half hour. Okay, so I'm going to skip some of the some of the uh, details of the motivations. Um, I did that in the last 15 minutes with a, a smaller group uh, comprised of some of the uh, um, uh, some of the students and postdocs. Uh, but let me tell you briefly what I'm going to try and uh, do. So uh, there will be some brief motivations, and I rapidly want to get to what is a a, a very a very important result i would say uh in in the last uh, couple of years which is this connection between J, jt gravity and uh and, and and matrix models and this was um uh well the seeds of it were in a number of papers before but then it was really put together and shown how to work at all orders in perturbation theory uh, uh by saad schenker and stanford and then uh stanford and witten followed up not long after showing how to define various other JT gravity models, in, in particular some, some super JT gravity models and, and variants of JT, other variants of JT gravity, uh, again in terms, of, uh, in terms of matrix models and showing how it all generalizes. And there's a beautiful classification there that's uh, quite important. I won't have time to go into any detail at all, but I want to get those ideas um, uh, solidified in your mind because what I want to do immediately is depart from those ideas. I want to say, yes, good. Um, uh, there's that correspondence. It's teaching us a lot of things, but a lot of the motivation for doing some of this is non-perturbative. And a lot of the physics, uh, a lot of the, the way the methods that are used to make this correspondence are um, very perturbative in character. So you need a way of defining uh, the non-perturbative physics and you have to go beyond what they did. And um, so one way of doing that informed by uh, work that has a similar spirit from several decades ago, uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, you can go back and look at this matrix model correspondence and see that there are other tools that are available that allow you to formulate the content of what they're doing perturbatively, but uh, it gives you better access to non-perturbative physics. So what I did in the various um, papers mentioned there in the green box is supply a, a, a non-perturbative definition for JT gravity and also for various variants of JT gravity, in particular, some of the super uh, uh, models that I'll tell you about. And um, it, it, it's, it, one can write some equations down and that's very nice and get, and get a definition. But what I also want to emphasize is that it is a definition with practical consequences. It allows you to compute things. And so I will compute things and show you the results. And, um, and, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about prospects for doing better than that. Sorry, doing more beyond that. Um, and indeed better than that. Okay, so uh, JT gravity in my brief motivation, my, this is my motivations slide, which is to show uh, and remind you 
that it in fact, in addition to being a model in its own right, lies at the intersection of a lot of very exciting ideas that are in the air right now, including, for example, um, the chaotic aspect of, uh, of, uh, of higher dimensional black holes, um, uh, the um, uh, low dimensional story connecting to the SYK model being a, a nice model that saturates certain uh, important bounds on quantum chaos that was suggested by Malthusen, um, Schenker and Stanford. Um, and that led to the idea uh, uh, pushed by Kataev that maybe this low dimensional, essentially chaotic quantum mechanical system called the SYK model is in fact secretly a theory of gravity. It has a gravity dual in the spirit of ADS CFT and at low energy at least, uh, that turns out to be borne out by the fact that uh, you can calculate uh, various properties and show that they are shared by JT gravity in just the right regime. So it, it connects together uh, uh, sort of a line like that. It also has two dimensional black holes in its own right. And of course, there's been a lot of excitement about that concerning, for example, demonstrating that you can construct the page curve for black hole evaporation, at least in two dimensions. And uh, that requires coupling JT to some external um, uh, system so that it can essentially radiate away and you can track that, keep track of that radiation. And there's been, as you probably have heard, a lot of excitement in how that works. And uh, so it lies at the heart of that as well. I should mention for those uh, who think that's only a two dimensional story, there's been some really interesting work um, by various authors. I, th I think um, uh, Rob Myers uh, is, on, is, on, is on all the relevant papers I'm talking about there, where they, they show how the essence of all of that demonstration uh, lifts in some sense to high dimensional stories. Um, uh, that you can you can uh, work through and see structurally the same sorts of things going on. Anyway, that's all well beyond the scope of what I want to talk about, uh, but I just want to sh uh, remind you that it's well motivated to understand JG gravity uh, because of all those intersections. It's also, as we'll see, a theory in its own right that's interesting. It's a toy theory of quantum gravity, and that's always exciting when you can make some progress in understanding that. And uh, key to all of that um, will be our understanding in terms of random matrix dynamics, which then in turn has a rich history of connections back to things like quantum chaos. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. Okay, so that, those are the motivations. JT gravity then uh, looks something like this for our purposes. And again, this is gonna be somewhat uh, a schematic because I, I need to move on to, to uh, the new stuff, but the key points are all here. Here's the action. I'm going to work in uh, uh, Euclidean time. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry. And uh, some of the key things then are as follows. Here's the, uh, here's one part of the bulk action. This is the usual Einstein Hilbert action completed by a boundary term, giving you the full Einstein, um, uh, Hilbert sector, which, as you know, in two dimensions actually contains no dynamics and is, is purely counting topology. So there's, uh, there's chi, um, the Euler density that it's essentially uh, uh, boils down to, and that Euler density counts um, uh, uh, topology in terms of number of handles, uh, boundaries, and cross caps if it's unorientable. And uh, the other key feature here then is that there's a, there's a parameter I'll call S naught, which is from the point of view of this being some dimensional reduction, for example, of a four dimensional extremal black hole near zero temperature, uh, S zero is the um, extremal entropy of that black hole, which will be a natural counting parameter for us. There's also a coupling of that scalar, of a scalar called phi, which essentially keeps track of the, the dynamics um, away from extremality and in some sense makes uh, this model interesting in the sense that uh, it's, not just topo it's not just pure topology anymore. There's some dynamics contained in the scalar. It couples in this particular way. 
and there's a boundary term as well. And the key point then is that just because of the way this coupling looks, you can see that the equations of motion for the scalar are essentially enforcing that this thing locally uh, has an ADS2 uh, geometry, uh, just R equals minus two in my units. And so there's some ADS2 geometry. Digging a little deeper, the boundary dynamics, the scalar set some, uh, uh, that controls the boundary dynamics as some, uh, uh, this is just a, a remnant of what I wrote down from, from, from the last slide. This boundary dynamics, when you work through it then, tells you, uh, what the dynamics of the theory is going to be. It essentially has some action controlled essentially by this piece here, uh, which is called the Schwarzschild, uh, it's just the Schwarzschild derivative. There's some parameter, boundary parameter, um, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, U, and uh, the action looks like this for some for some function of ut telling me the shape of the boundary. And uh, the key point then is that the temperature of the theory, and you can think of that as the temperature of the parent black hole from which this came from, is given by, well, uh, one over t is, is, the, is, is, the, is the length beta. The length of that boundary is fixed. I'm working at some temperature t. Um, length of the boundary is fixed to be one over t, but otherwise that boundary can fluctuate. And that essentially is all the dynamics that's in the theory. Uh, that boundary can fluctuate and you can then calculate what that is. You can compute the, the Schwarzschild dynamics and see what you get. And so this uh, here are some, some of the authors of some of the early papers uh, making that all somewhat concrete. And when you, do the comp when you do the computation, the partition function of the theory looks like this. So let me, let me uh, point to a couple of features. Uh, an important feature here is that, um, an important feature here is that, well, there's the beta dependence, first of all. Um, very importantly, I have e to the s naught here. Uh, e to the s naught is, uh, coming from the fact that I'm essentially on a disk topology and going back to my previous slide, you'll see if I, if I look at the uh, coupling, let's, uh, let's, let's just jump back. If I look back here and I put, uh, I put G equals zero and C equals zero and B equals one, one boundary me, giving me the disk, I have that E to the S naught factor. And so that e to the s naught factor is telling me that I'm on the disk. The counting parameter that I will often use in what is to follow will, I will rather suggestively define, or rather cheekily you might say, define something called h bar, which will be e to the minus s naught. And so we're at order h bar, h bar to the minus one here is the disk. Okay. A focus for, oh, I had it all written on the next slide anyway. A focus for a lot of uh, the physics I'm going to talk about is to rewrite this in terms of some spectral density that this model um, has, which you can think of, if you like, as the, the average spectrum of the parent black hole, if you want to think of it in those terms. And this is rho naught uh, defined by uh, Laplace transform in that way. Uh, and there you have, uh, so I'm going to write things this way uh, a lot in terms of rho, just a Laplace transform. And now I've put the h bar in. There is a super version of this, JT supergravity version of this, which I will focus on a lot in the later parts of the talk, because in some sense they have better non-perturbative behavior, and so it'd be easier to capture some of those in a quick talk. And um, this is uh, this looks like this uh, instead of a instead of a, uh, a hyperbolic sine, I have a hyperbolic cosine, and crucially, I have outside a one over root e as well, and that will be uh, important in what is to come. Okay, so that's it from the point of view of my uh, telling you what JT gravity is, and apologize for it being so brief, but details aside what I'm going to focus on is how I go beyond. I've put a little zero 
on each of these, meaning that um, uh, sort of tree level, if you like, a leading order um, in some other notation, I guess it should have been minus one or something like that. But the point is, is that I want to do more than just this. I want to go beyond the disk. So with regard to diagrams I might draw later on uh, as a shorthand, I'm going to take that thing where I had a disk representing ADS2 or nearly ADS2 as it's almost called, or, sorry, as it's often called, sometimes almost ADS2. There's some boundary uh, of length beta, which, uh, which can, which can, uh, uh, which can fluctuate according to the Schwarzschild dynamics. I will often draw it this way. Uh, a lot of people do this. The idea being that uh, this is meant to be it looks like a ice cream cone, but it's meant to be more of a sort of trumpet shape, showing you that hyperbolic geometry, saying the bulk is ADS two, and then there's some boundary. So that'll be my shorthand for uh, the Schwarzschild result. And I want to do more than this. I want to say, well, what happens if I had handles? What happens if I had more topology? And it'll look like this in my diagrammatics. You might ask, well, why? Well, it actually goes to some of the original motivation of, of, uh, that brought us here in the first place. So what is, what is the, um, what is the, uh, what are the methods by which you, for example, diagnose some of the chaos, some of the, the chaotic features that are in the model? You look at correlation, you look at correlations in the spectrum, for example. That'll that'll encourage you to compute on the gravity side. It'll encourage you to compute uh, essentially two copies of the partition function, and uh, you're looking at z z. And in our diagrammatics, it'll look, oh, that's, uh, that's the worst diagram. In, in our diagrammatics, it'll look like two copies of this uh, cone, trumpet. But there'll also be, there'll also be uh, diagrams that uh, are connected like that. And those will be contributors to the computation as well. And there'll also be then corrections to those diagrams, which will have little loops on them. So. Uh, asking for what the physics involving multiple boundaries be um, and possibly multiple cost caps in the case where I have non-orientable uh, uh, diagrams and uh, multiple genus is a natural question to ask. But then what we'll see is that completing that perturbation theory isn't enough. We really need to understand how to go beyond that perturbative expansion. And uh, this diagram is meant to motivate that. So if I plot that cinch function that I drew before um, as a function of E, label your axes, then uh, it looks something like this. And that's essentially that disk level classical result. Now, actually, as, we'll, as, as I'll talk about uh, a little bit later, uh, when you complete all the non-perturbative story, you will get not just corrections to that, but you'll get significant deviations representing, for example, these wiggles I'm showing you here. And those wiggles are, of course, very important physics. Uh, there'll be a lot of very important physics happening at the ultra low energies as well. And those all come from non-perturbative effects. And in particular, these wiggles you can think of going back to that high dimensional picture, you can think of it in terms of the average spectrum of that of the parent black hole. The black holes, of course, have a discrete spectrum. That's what we learn by the fact that they have some finite entropy from, from uh, Hawking and Bekenstein, et cetera. And they have some discrete spectrum. And in some sense, all of this story is computing some sort of average of how can we see that discrete spectrum? We don't get to see a particular copy of it. We see multiple copies and we see peaks near where those ensembles of black holes have lots of, uh, uh, have, have, have lots of uh, contributions to the spectrum and valleys where they have fewer. And uh, so that's what those bumps represent. So in order to see that, we need to see non-perturbative physics. Those ripples are intrinsically non-perturbative. The other important, uh, feature that uh, uh, we'd like to get at are um, uh, other direct, more direct probes of quantum chaos, most famously the spectral form factor, which is essentially a two-point function 
of the partition function, which has been continued in such a way, um, essentially writing it is dependence in terms of this, this time that then represents the, uh, as you study it as a function of time, you, rep you, you, you study how uh, the spectrum of correlations uh, dies away um, over, over long times. And uh, again, as I said, you will have contributions that look like this, you'll have pieces like that, but you'll also have non-perturbative pieces. Very famously, the spectral form factor is made up of, of uh, pieces that have at uh, early to intermediate times a decay that looks like this, and, um, and then a rise along something that's often called a ramp, and then it's, it saturates uh, to something called the uh, uh, plateau, and all those pieces put together, the full story of how those things put together, in particular how this ramp turns into this plateau region, uh, requires an understanding of non-perturbative physics of the model. So the upshot is, is that I'm going to show you how to compute all of that stuff. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the motivation. Okay, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of talk, uh, let's, uh, let's get down to business. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot. Um, more recent work <laughs> um, that I put out recently, which I, I may not get to, but I, 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 let me summarize a little bit of it in case we don't get to it, is trying to understand the low temperature dynamics of, uh, of, of various uh, JT gravity models. And again, that'll need some non-perturbative input. As you'll see from the results that I talk about, the low temperature, the low temperature, the low energy sector will have severe um, uh, deviations from some things that you would guess from per perturbation theory alone, coming from non-perturbative physics. So in order to understand the low temperature dynamics, uh, you will need um, connection to the non-perturbative physics. Uh, you'll need those insights. Most importantly there is trying to understand how to compute the free energy as a function of temperature. And at high temperature, you can get away with computing what's called the annealed um, uh, free energy. And, and uh, that's the free energy we usually compute when we're doing semi-classical quantum gravity. We write down, we, we write down the partition function, and we, we, uh, we take the logarithm of it and, 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 and throw in that factor and call it the free energy. We compute the entropy and various other quantities from it. What we're really doing is we're writing down the log, we're working with the logarithm of the average of the partition function. At low temperature, um, uh, that's going to run you into trouble. That's not the right thing to compute. You should be looking really for computing the free energy, the average of the logarithm, which is a much harder thing to compute. This is well known in, for example, condensed matter and other um, uh, related areas of physics. And uh, so oftentimes people use what's called the replica trick. And you might wonder if something like the replica trick would work here as, for example, um, uh, Netta Englart and, and uh, uh, Stefan uh, uh, um, Franchetti and uh, Alex Maloney did in a paper in July, and uh, they they uh, they made some interesting progress in understanding the, the some of the features that that may emerge. Uh, I uh, wrote this paper uh, trying to uh, push things a little further and showing that the ultra low temperature dynamics has a very nice can be captured very nicely in terms of some of the language that I've been talking about recently. Uh, and it informs how to do an analog of this calculation that will result in some uh, equations that look like this. You can think of this as the ultra low physics. What will emerge is a quadratic dependence on temperature that is controlled by a parameter that will emerge naturally in some models. Uh, uh, that I that I'll uh, explain shortly. It's some odd-looking degeneracy at zero en uh, energy. It's the spectral density at, at e equals zero is finite in 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 uh, in, in some models. And you might, and uh, wondering what that means and what that controls led me to uh, studying some of this. And essentially, what you make contact with is the uh some ideas that go back as far as um let's see if i have it here no i don't it goes back as far as um uh preskill et al wondering about when the thermodynamics of black holes um 
extremal black holes will break down as it must if you have a finite spectrum, um, if you have a discrete spectrum. And in some sense, this row controls the lowest energy, or in our case, the energy gap, the average energy gap of the model. That's, that's the lowest temperature you can get to before you can no longer emit quanta in, in some way that has a good description in terms of uh, thermodynamics. So that'll all emerge, although I probably won't get to this in time, but you can read some of the details there. Although uh, this discussion in terms of the gap, I should, I should, I intend to update that paper and haven't got around to it yet. Okay, that's a lot uh, to be getting on with. Let me tell you some of the ingredients then. So matrix models, so what Saad Schenker and Stanford uh, showed in this paper then is this remarkable uh, result that there's some sort of uh, other description of JT gravity in terms of some matrix model uh, uh, in the double scaling limit. And so I need to tell you a little bit about what the double scaling limit is. So I need to go back in history a little bit. So imagine, uh, and this goes back uh, to, to people like Wigner, et cetera, very early on, uh, beginning to wonder about ensembles of, uh, of matrices, uh, ensembles of, uh, of Hamiltonians was the original thought. And so you might have M being some, some, uh, some N by N Hermitian matrix. And, uh, and, and there's the, uh, if you like, the probability um, uh, uh, distribution. If I, just, if, I, if I just had this quadratic piece, this would be your usual sort of Gaussian matrix model, but you could imagine adding additional pieces. And adding additional pieces is well motivated from the point of view of, for example, quantum field theory, thinking of this as some sort of toy version of something more sophisticated like QCD, et cetera. And in, in comes then ideas, for example, uh, like uh, those given to us in the 70s by Tuft, which was saying, well, actually it makes sense to think of these sorts of things as um, an expansion in some large N because you then have essentially that uh, expansion one over N gives you a new parameter and that parameter essentially counts topology. Let me get rid of that and point with this. You realize that at large N, the, uh, there's a family of diagrams you can draw that look like this. There's, uh, you can draw them on thing, surfaces that have the topology of a sphere or the plane. There are other diagrams you can draw that you can't do that for, but you can actually see that they're of order n to the minus two, and you can draw them on something that has the topology of a torus and so on and so forth. There's a topological organization of the expansion. And that's sort of very interesting and very suggestive uh, for uh, a number of reasons. Um, the string theorists uh, and, uh, got very excited about this because, uh, of course, we're very interested in finding ways of organizing the sum over surfaces of different topology because they look like string world sheets. But also, if you imagine that this is some sort of two-dimensional theory of gravity, uh, Euclidianized, then these are the kinds of topological surfaces you should include in the partition function representing the fact that quantum gravity tells you that the surfaces should be able to change topology. A more precise understanding of this goes as follows. I should think of, uh, what color should I use, red? I should think of these diagrams, uh, oh, and by the way, I should say these, these uh, this, I'm doing quantum field theory here, M gives me a propagator, uh, M squared gives me a propagator, M to the four gives me a vertex. So that's why I have quartic vertices here. And this double line, you can think of it as sort of uh, propagating M, the matrix. And it has, a, it, it has an index I and an index J. And in some ways, that's what's being propagated in these diagrams. And so these ribbon diagrams uh, are what make it uh, what make it interesting. If these weren't ribbon diagrams, the topology would be meaningless. Okay, so uh, having said all of that, uh, you can also decorate these diagrams in a different way. You can, for example, uh, replace every loop in those diagrams by a vertex, and every propagator gets replaced by a uh, 
a line like that. And so you can see that I'm going to start building up a different way of thinking about these. These are diagrams that are dual to the green diagram I just drew. And you can see directly then that in some ways what I'm doing is I'm tessellating the sphere out of these quadrilaterals in this case. In this case, it's a rather simple tessellation. It's essentially just I'm gluing this, um, I'm, I'm essentially gluing like that. And uh, that's a little bit, uh, that's a little bit uh, like a very poor approximation to a sphere, but it is a sphere. But if I had a diagram with more loops uh, and uh, more vertices, I'd get a better approximation because I'd be building that sphere out of more, um, more tiles and so on and so forth. And similarly at higher topology, and so the double scaling, the double scaling limit is actually a limit that says, I actually, in taking n to infinity, which I've been doing in drawing these diagrams organized in this way, I also tune my model so that I um, pick out the physics where those large, the large surfaces, the ones that have lots and lots and lots of squares uh, uh, dominate. And that in some sense represents, if I go back to this drawing, it represents making better and better approximations to the smooth geometry. Instead of those, uh, these diagrams become less important than diagrams that look more now like uh, uh, a fishnet. And if you tune things in the right way, you can actually pick out universal physics. And uh, the double scaling limit uh, essentially tells you how to do that uh, carefully. And that was due to Brezhan Kazakov, Douglas Schenker, and Grosser McDowell back in, uh, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. So uh, what Stanford and Schenker and uh, Saad Schenker and Schenker, Triple S, what Triple S showed was that a model that has that character is essentially also controlling the uh, a, a description of, the, uh, of JT gravity. I need to just say a little bit more in order to show you exactly how that description works. And it goes as follows. What you do is uh, in, in studying these matrix models is you actually work with uh, the eigenvalues. You, you diagonalize the matrix uh, with a unitary. And then you have this lambda object here, which is essentially just the, uh, the, the energy eigenvalues running down the diagonal. And um, uh, the, 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 the unitary part of the model essentially factorizes out and you just have a model of the dynamics of the eigenvalues. The Jacobian for changing, doing that change of variables turns into something called the van der Mond determinant. And then you have essentially just that trace of V of M turns into a sum of the uh, V of the eigenvalues in that way. This model, often called a Dyson gas, you can think of intuitively as follows. It's essentially, there's essentially two pieces. There's, a, there's the potential, so I say has this sort of form like that, which is sort of trying to confine the eigenvalues, so exerting a force on them this way. But this van der Mond determinant is essentially, is essentially a, a logarithmic repulsive force uh, between those uh, eigenvalues, which sort of pushes them back out. And so there's some, uh, balance between the two that gives you some sort of droplet, which you essentially solve for uh, in using these large end techniques. The key point is that the double scaling limit focuses on the endpoint of this eigenvalue density. Essentially, that universal physics blows up just the neighborhood of the endpoint, and all of that other stuff goes off to infinity. And so, I'm going to use. Uh, e without a tilde on it to talk about these, this, uh, the scaling limit, the double scaling limit, and that's the E I've been using so far. And so that essentially is what they uh, are saying. They can't explicitly write down the double scale potential for you, but they can essentially tell you that this, the, the tree level row uh, has, that, uh, has that character. Let me just give you a quick example. The, the, fam the most famous uh, distribution is uh, the Wigner um, uh, semicircular law, which looks like this. This is just the Gaussian case. And in fact, you can go ahead and zoom in and uh, just get this, um, 
this behavior, uh, this e to the half type behavior um, for, the, uh, for the physics. Um, what I'm going to uh, uh, allude to and briefly talk about later on is the fact that this is just one of a family of such models you can get more careful tuning by using more complicated potential and then double scaling um, will give you models that have e to the different power and e to the k minus a half will be the characteristic signature of those models and essentially what we've been working with is k equals one which is often called the airy model for reasons that i'll hopefully get into later on this family of models then um, actually an individual one that has this e to the k minus a half character um, are indeed the double scale matrix models that people played with uh, a lot in the early 90s studying um, uh, essentially string theory world sheets which you can also interpret as certain types of conformal field theories coupled to two-dimensional quantum gravity and those were later on called minimal strings what I'm going to use, what I'm going to show you essentially, or at least uh, argue, uh, and you have to read the paper for the details, uh, is that um, in both the bosonic and the super cases, uh, you can use minimal strings and another family of minimal strings I'll talk about shortly uh, to build, you essentially take uh, a recipe that tells you how to combine an infinite number of them in such a way as to define JT gravity. The key excitement from the 90s was that you can study these minimal strings non-perturbatively as well as perturbatively. And so in being able to build JT gravity out of these minimal strings, I will also be able to build non-perturbative JT gravity or families of non-perturbative JT gravities by using the same non-perturbative type uh, intuition and technology um, that was first done in the, in the 90s. So that's the roadmap, in case I don't get all the way there, that's, that's, uh, that's the intent. Okay, so um, what is this? How do I deduce the existence of this recipe? Well, let's go back and look at the leading order uh, row uh, spectral density. And you can see, if I expand it in terms of, uh, um, expand it uh, as a power of series in E, you can see already signs of what I was talking about. There's the, there's the leading piece is, is e to the half, and there's e to the three halves, phi half, five halves. It looks in some sense that I will make more precise that um, if, if I could put together minimal strings in such a way that they collectively uh, give me a spectral density that, that is made up of this, but an infinite number, because this is an infinite series, um, and I can tune the coefficients in such a way that I can match this, then I can build JT gravity explicitly. So if you think of it as a deconstruction of JT gravity. And similarly, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, the super case, um, which is maybe what I'll focus on because it, it, it has more immediate, uh, immediately accessible non-perturbative properties. One of the things that's interesting about the super JT gravity is that it has that leading one over root E, so it's actually divergent at E equals zero uh, in, 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 uh, on the disk. And uh, one of the things we'll see is uh, that exciting non-perturbative physics will, will change that uh, when, we, when we get there. Okay, so, um, so let's just go back to JT gravity then. So, as I said, I want more than just the disk. I want higher order topology. So I want some sum over all the possibilities, but I also want non-perturbative physics. I want to go beyond just perturbation phys physics. I want, to, I want this and beyond, as, I, as I've been saying. Now, Triple S and SW were motivated also, uh, of course, um, long before I jumped into this, uh, they were already going, it would be nice if we could find how to do more than just the disk. And uh, th that's what led to the matrix model description. And how they did it is they, they wrote recursion relations. You can write down generally, given the kind of matrix model that you're working with, for example, a Hermitian matrix model, you can derive recursion relations that tell you that if you know the spectral density at genus G minus one, 
the recursion relations tell you how to define the spectral density at genus G. And so given that the Schwarzschild dynamics tells you row zero, you can define the matrix model even without knowing the precise spectral, even without knowing the precise potential, you can define the matrix model. You can infer what the double scaled version of those uh, recursion relations would look like and thereby deduce the form of all of these rows and by Laplace transform all of the higher order corrections to Z, uh, the partition function. And that's essentially what they did. It was a, a beautiful piece of work. And the key piece then, the key piece for them is to show that at every order of perturbation theory, if you actually did the full quantum gravity, JD gravity computation, so you need to properly, uh, 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 properly organize the sum over uh, um, topology, uh, the sum over surfaces of a given topology, et cetera, and that requires some rather beautiful uh, mathematics um, uh, that, they, that they bring in and do the computation and then can compare it to what the recursion relations, another beautiful piece of mathematics um, due to people like Merzakhani and Eniard Orenten, um, you can actually show that the correspondence works. So this is highly non-trivial and, and, and quite beautiful. And, and uh, I, will, I will talk about none of those details except to tell you that it is, it is, uh, it is, it is a beautiful story that I, I, I strongly recommend. We're not going to um, be, be uh, following that route. They've already done that route. What I want to do is say, given that there's a double scale matrix model, there's another way that we can do the same story, arrive at the same physics, but also have non-perturbative physics. And so that leads me to dive a little bit more deeply into, uh, into the matrix models. And the key feature is that for a class of uh, uh, double scale matrix models, not all by, by, um, by any stretch of the imagination, but for a class, certainly a class that's relevant to what we're interested in here, this, uh, this, this, the spectral density essentially arises from considering what you might think of as an auxiliary problem, an auxiliary problem that happens to be supplied by the matrix model after double scaling. Out from the matrix model comes a function which I will call u of x. There's some parameter x. You don't need to worry about what it is just yet, but there's some essentially, then there's a Hamiltonian you can write down where x is a position. And this is some Schrodinger Hamiltonian whose spectrum that if you knew u, you could in principle compute. And uh, so that u actually arises um, from the double scale matrix model. And the double scale matrix model, what it does, it tells you what U is, it tells you what its boundary conditions are, and then it says it satisfies a certain um, uh, highly nonlinear ordinary differential equation, which in the old days we called the string equation. Um, and uh, so if you can solve that equation and uh, find that U and then solve this spectral problem, you can extract a spectral density from it in this way, and I'll say more about that uh, shortly. And uh, that will be a way of solving for the spectral density of that double scale emission matrix model, uh, sorry, not emission matrix, matrix model in general. And so essentially then you can see that an equivalent statement of uh, the matrix model of, that we need for JT gravity is to say, um, I need to find what this U is. I need to define this U. So the methods of triple S, et cetera, don't tell you how to define the matrix model potential, which is not this U, uh, which, you, which, you, uh, which would arrive from the double scaling limit. Essentially the recursion relations define everything order by order. But in principle, there is some, there is some non-perturbative information there. Uh, and what, what uh, I'm saying here is that, well, you can take a completely different route and say, I'm going to look at this auxiliary problem and knowing this is equivalent to knowing um, the, full, the full story. So our job will be to find these, the appropriate U. How do I work with this U uh, in general? Well, you just solve the, prob the full problem that I just talked about, but at leading order, to make contact with the disk level that we were talking about at leading order, it looks something like this. 
the H bar that I've been talking about now you can see is the H bar of this sort of toy auxiliary quantum picture, and which is one of the reasons it's called H bar. And at leading order, uh, you know, if you turned off H bar, essentially there's some part of the U survives, and I'm going to call it just U subscript zero to match my earlier notation. And uh, that U of zero actually uh, tells you that extraction of the, let me go back, uh, that extraction here reduces in that limit to doing, uh, oops, to doing, uh, to doing an integral that looks like this. And visually, this is what's going on. I have u of x, which looks something like this. There's x, and uh, there's some function u of x. And essentially, what this is doing, it's essentially a little piece of WKB analysis. It's telling me, so I pick some energy E, and I keep, I look in the part where the square root is real. I compute that. I do this integral, and that's rho of E. So it's essentially constructing you know, as I do this over various E's, I will construct then some rho as a function of E. And so essentially, visually, that's what's going on. The reason I, I bring this up is because there's a lot of really important intuition, a lot of which I won't have time to go into, um, to be gained from actually looking at how U behaves, not just on the sphere, but also fully non-perturbatively uh, in order to give you then the rho that you will get uh, when you do the full uh, story. In particular, when you start doing quantum corrections and when you start doing non-perturbative corrections, the shape of U um, will tell you um, uh, important physics, for example, the presence of non-perturbative problems and things like that, none of which I'll have much time to go into in detail, but uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful language, a lot of which was, which was laid out in the early days and which uh, has since been refined in, in work of mine and others um, in, in, in more recent years. Okay, so I will, I will, um, I will now uh, look uh, at the clock and make some decisions about um, uh, uh, some things I should skip. Okay, let me, uh, let me, try, and, uh, let me try and motivate uh, a whole bunch of calculations with this one slide. The other reason I worked at tree level here um, to tell you this is because I can make now contact with uh, JT gravity and, uh, and, and, uh, and cousins thereof in the following sense. Uh, I can, I can uh, given, uh, sorry, this should be U zero, given some known uh, row, and we have, for example, from JT, we have cinch uh, root e, essentially. There's some factors of two pi, don't worry about. I can essentially ask, well, what, what, uh, what has to go in here in this integral in order to give me this function cinch of e? And uh, oftentimes, uh, I prefer to write things in terms of uh, an integral, an integral over the variable which is uh, which is u zero itself uh, after a change of variables, where that's the Jacobian, and essentially you can see that this is telling me what the functional dependence of u of zero of x is. So if I know what u of zero of x goes in uh, into this, either in this way of presenting it or this way of presenting it, it tells me what cinch, uh, how to build that cinch. And essentially then, if you remember then, I said, well, this has an expansion in terms of uh, uh, root E and some coefficient E to the three halves, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so one way of thinking about what this is, it's a recipe telling me what of the various, it'll turn out you can write down the U for each of the minimal models the minimal strings, what combinations of these minimal strings do I put together in order to get these coefficients? These minimal strings are parameterized. You, you essentially put them together with coefficients that are often denoted T subscript K, where K is the kth model. And essentially, 
the recipe then for what the TKs are tells you how to build your JT gravity. But that just reproduces what we already know at the disk. The point is then is that the full U satisfies some nonlinear differential equation that tells me all of the perturbation theory and the non perturbative physics. And so essentially, I, by matching to the disk, I know what the TK recipe is. And then the full equation tells me the rest of the whole story, including the non perturbative physics. So that's essentially the roadmap. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip uh, a bunch of slides with perhaps more detail of that um, uh, just uh, to save time. And I'm going to jump then to uh, another important ingredient, which is, uh, uh, excuse me, um, people always comment, it, it, it's, it isn't that many slides. Every build gets a slide number. There's far fewer than, than the, the hundred and something slides you see here. Okay, let me say a little bit about the super models um, uh, that we want to talk about here. Um, <clears throat> a key additional agree ingredient is to uh, have also some physics that captures this one over root E behavior. Those models, uh, remember those go like uh, at the tree level, they go like cosh of root E over root E. So that cos starts out with a one, and then uh, so you, you get that, and then there's the e to the half, et cetera, et cetera, with different coefficients than you have for JG gravity. Um, the, in some ways, the, uh, the one way of thinking about where this one over root e behavior comes from is what the model is doing in the neighborhood of uh, of um, well, it's right here. What if you had some part of the potential that at least a leading order goes just like zero, um, uh, u goes to zero. And you can see immediately that uh, I just neglect this piece here and that controls this root e sort of uh, leading behavior. So there's a class of models then that uh, come from, uh, one way of thinking about where they come from is a different class of matrix models that provide a different sort of behavior at, um, at, uh, at low energies that give you that sort of root E behavior. And uh, they are, they're, they're complex matrix models and you can study their double skating limit and they look rather, a lot of the technology looks rather like what I outlined for the emission matrix model case. And I don't have time to go into it, except to say that when you do all of it, do all the double skating limit and understand various features of it, uh, um, and some of the key papers were uh, were were uh, were here, where a, a certain kind of string equation emerges um, that is uh, that is going to be key uh, for us to solve in a moment. Uh, the physics uh, incorporates some of that behavior I just talked about. So I'm just going to jump a little bit to uh, the result right here. The string equation that emerges looks like this. So I haven't told you, I haven't shown you one of the string equations yet. So I'm now going to do that. And they look some, sort of like this. There's u, the function u, u of x, which looks like this, the u that we've been talking about. Um, there's a rather, this is a rather complex, uh, sort of compact notation there's a function for every k, there's a polynomial in u and its derivatives, which sort of leads off like u to some power k. And then it also has u differentiated 2k minus two times. And then it has mixtures of u's and u primes of various powers um, in those double dots. So that's some complicated polynomial um, built out of u and its derivatives. The kth model has a particular one uh, uh, of those uh, RK. When I have multiple versions of those models parameterized by T, uh, uh, the strength of the mixture, if you like, as I said, is given by TK, then I essentially define in this rather nice way, I, linear, I just add these things together linearly. So I combine the models linearly, although they are individually nonlinear. I get the, I get that. And then there's this parameter x, which is, if you like, that uh, 
that, that position in that auxiliary quantum mechanics. This quantity then uh, is the thing I called R, and here it is, a prime denotes a derivative. And so it's a rather complicated equation. Gamma is a parameter which uh, is fixed uh, depending upon the model. Um, and uh, I will tell you what that is shortly when we come and look at examples. And uh, in particular then, what you need to do is solve that differential equation. And at disk level, it looks something like this. So uh, h bar going to zero, essentially there's an h bar with every derivative. And uh, setting h bar to zero essentially kills all of those terms except this last one here. And then I have two solutions. I have r equals zero or I have u equals zero. R equals zero, essentially, if I took R equals zero everywhere for all X, that's essentially the string equation of the original emission matrix models that we, uh, that I talked about before. Um, uh, the kind of models that I'm gonna talk about a lot for non-perturbative good behavior, actually, it'll turn out that I combine this R equals zero behavior in, in a large negative X regime with the other boundary condition that I can get from this, which is that u goes to zero. That u going to zero will control that one over root e behavior that I talked about before, and I'll have something like this. So on the sphere, this will be what the model looks like. Sorry, the sphere. At the disk level, this is what the model sort of looks like. Um, a particular case model has this sort of behavior. Um, uh, when I solve r equals zero in the this regime, and then u equals zero takes over in that regime. And you can find smooth solutions to the equations, and this actually was my thesis work uh, 30 years ago, you can find smooth solutions to those models that actually define for you non-perturbative physics uh, rather nicely for these uh, kinds of models. So in view of the time, I won't, um, I won't go into a lot of the details, because um, I sort of took, took a different focus um, for, for this talk. But the point then is to combine together, oh, oh uh, sorry, one last thing, one last feature. The last thing I should mention from this slide is that uh, the behavior in this direction if you look at it, this also corresponds to going to higher and higher energies. Remember my previous diagram, that's energy. Going to higher and higher energy, I have this, um, I'm, I'm getting more and more of this kind of physics uh, showing up as I go uh, to um, this large negative X regime. And that essentially produces contributions that give you that row of E going like E to the k minus a half type characteristic behavior I was talking about. And so um, if I can combine together these models in such a way that I have the right coefficients for these to build either JT gravity or various super JT gravities, um, I can actually build uh, the, uh, I can actually build the, uh, by extract by solving then the differential equations, I can actually get the uh, perturbative and non-perturbative physics as a, as a, as an alternative approach to the triple S sorts of methods. The key point then is that I can actually go beyond and extract uh, non-perturbative physics from that differential equation in the way that I alluded to earlier. Okay, so in view of the time, I think what I should do is show you some results. Now you have a sense of how it actually works. And the key point is that it would seem that I have to solve an infinite order differential equation because I need to take an infinite number of these models and put them together. And that is not how you support practical. Sorry, I just noticed that. <laughs> it's a C. Um, uh, and, and so it would seem that everything I just told you is somewhat formal because I have to solve this, this, this infinite order differential equation. But the key result um, is that you don't. 
um, if you actually look at the, how these coefficients organize themselves, um, for example, in the simplest case, uh, for the bosonic case, uh, sorry, for the uh, supersymmetric case, um, they actually, they rise for a while at low k, and then actually they rapidly begin to become less and less important. Um, if I work at a given energy, up to a given energy, I can truncate the theory in some sensible controlled way and not have to go to infinite k. So I, I don't have to solve an infinite number of differential, uh, order differential equations. I can actually solve a, uh, a finite order differential equation. And uh, this, this is relevant. Uh, let me go to this. So uh, visually, this is what it looks like. I can write down the exact disk uh, result, which looks like this black curve. Um, and I can actually truncate the theory by including more, uh, um, more and more, I can, sorry, I can build up more and more accurate approximations to this curve by adding in more and more minimal models. Uh, this is this is what the actual equation looks like for you and uh, the tree level string equation. This is the exact case. And for example, by truncating to the first few, this dotted line actually agrees rather well below certain energies. So I can do my construction. I can draw that green line that I drew before, for example. And all the physics down here is actually a rather good approximation to the physics I need uh, in order to uh, study, for example, um, the low energy spectrum. And in fact, when I go to higher and higher energies, the quantum effects are less and less important. So I can actually uh, 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 have my cake and eat it in that I can, I can do perturbation theory up here. And then for non-perturbative non physics, I can use this truncation scheme and connect through and actually get access to um, a lot of the physics that way. So in view of the time, I'm just going to show you some results that you can, you, can, uh, you can get from all of that. This is what happens if you actually solve one of those differential equations. You have to go up to some high order in order to get reasonable accuracy. And I, I, I was solving 12th and 13th order differential equations in order to do this. And this is sort of possible on my little, on my little computer. And um, this is Remember, the, remember that, uh, that thing that looked like a curve and then a zero for positive x? Well, it then gets completed into this nice smooth curve uh, by those differential equations, that differential equation I solve. And then I solve the spectrum uh, of the Hamiltonian with this as its spectrum and extract the, uh, extract the uh, spectral density. And here we have some of the physics. So in view of the time, let me talk about the key features here. This is one of the supergravity models um, that, I, that I alluded to the existence of that in some ways have a nice, uh, a nicer, simpler to discuss uh, non-perturbative sector. There's that one over root e divergence. And non-perturbative effects actually remove that and actually cancel this to zero. And then there are the kind of wiggles. Yeah, sorry, that's meant to be a pointer. There are the kind of bumps I was telling you, talking about the non-perturbative uh, average discrete spectrum that uh, that I promised we'd have access to if we do this um, if we do this right. So this is um, when 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 this came out back in June. Uh, this represents uh, you know the the first uh, fully non-perturbative construction of uh, of JT gravity. Um, uh, partition function uh, uh, using using uh, this deconstruction in terms of minimal model. You can do it for another interesting case, uh, the zero two case, which actually doesn't cancel that diversion. S some of that cancellation and non-cancellation was anticipated by uh, Stanford and Witten in their 2019 paper, um, but the full spectrum to arbitrary energies um, is uh, is available with this definition of mine in these earlier in these more recent papers. You can also compute the spectral form factor, uh, and, and uh, I didn't have time to tell you how that works, but uh, you can actually extract. There's a, there's a, these are real examples then of the curves that I sketched for you as cartoons previously. And uh, this is the full uh, result showing you that, that, uh, that uh, decline, the dip, 
the ramp or what survives of the ramp in the limit I'm working in, and then the plateau. All of this is non-perturbative physics that you would not have access to without some non-perturbative definition of the theory. And uh, so reading off when these different, uh, at what times these different features take over is key to diagnosing the non-perturbative, uh, the, uh, the, the chaotic spectrum of your JG gravity uh, that you might be interested in. And then finally, the, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's another supergravity, which is in some sense, in spirit, closest to the uh, bosonic JT gravity that actually has a finite uh, rho uh, at E equals zero is actually finite. I should have plotted for you a blown up region of that. And one of the things you might ask then is what is the physics of that rho of zero? And I've already told you essentially then that that was the point of uh, some of the more recent work I've been doing where you, you wonder, and that's not how you spell physics, um, the, the, you might wonder what the meaning of it is. It looks rather like you have some sort of degeneracy at E equals zero, which reminds you of physics of spinning glasses and things like that. And that connect nicely with some results that uh, Englert et al. had trying to make contact with spin glasses and JT gravity. And uh, so I set about to compute the free energy in this regime. And there's a low temperature, small H bar limit in which you can describe that all in terms of a nice simple minimal model called the Bessel model. And when I do that, I extract, as I already showed you, so I'm skipping over the replica trick technology, uh, I actually end up uh, making contact with some of those ideas I mentioned at the beginning where this row of zero controls the very low temperature dynamics of the theory that you can compute in that model, that value row zero is also up to a factor because it essentially is just zeros of a Bessel function controls it. Uh, also that first um, excited energy or the average excited energy of the parent black hole. And this, for those of you who know some of the older literature, is in some ways the conjectured gap that you should, you should expect in the spectrum of the thermodynamics for the, studying the thermodynamics of extremal black holes, going back to Preskill, et cetera, uh, way back. I've said a lot. Um, I've run over. I think this is probably a good time to uh, um, uh, transition into uh, discussion. And uh, thank you all for being uh, extremely patient um, with me uh, going on a little bit, uh, four or five minutes over the time. Thank you very much, Cliff. That was a very cool talk. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna stop the recording now.